Hey friends, this is Allison Steele, and you're listening to Unravel with Allison, a show where I take a concept that's got me in knots, and we unravel it together. Thanks for being here. Today we are talking about information. Jumping straight into the definition, information is facts provided or learned about something or someone, or what is conveyed or represented by a particular arrangement or sequence of things. It's what you know, or what is being presented to you. It's not truth. You can know stuff without believing in it. It's just information. It's formed knowledge. It's a collection of your knowledge, your collective knowledge. (laughs) So when you have these details, you are in formation. What is formation? That's really what we're playing with here. We have to discover what formation is so we can identify when it's in alignment or in formation. So formation is three things. The action of forming or process of being formed. Formation is a structure or arrangement of something. And formation is a formal arrangement. We're going to start with the formal arrangement and jump on back to high school. I was in the marching band and one of the things that we had to do was be in formation. We had certain spots we were supposed to be on the field. We have to move in order so everything looks right. Even going from point A to point B off of the field, we had rules about not breaking the line and staying in formation as we travel. And we do this on field because of the visual aesthetic, but we do it off the field too for this collective connection. You're vibing with your surroundings. You are part of one. We are together and you're not going to break us. There was a message being sent in those particular movements. Also in marching band, when I played the trombone, our group did this move called suicides, which meant we all line up in a row and to the beat of the song, we swing the trombone to the side and back forward and then beneath our legs and back up. Meanwhile, the person next to you is doing the exact same thing, but opposite. So when you're bending down between your legs, they're swinging their trombone end over your head and then swinging forward as you pop back up. And this is done fast and looks amazing. And it's a lot of fun to do and really dangerous to practice. If you're not in formation, you are getting a fat lip. If you stumble or trip up or lose your footing, you are getting a fat lip. That trombone slide will hit the ground and you will bust your face. I've seen other groups do it where they kind of put it to their shoulder and do the same moves. But we were old school. We liked the danger. (laughs) And yeah, we would keep it at the mouthpiece and stay in formation. And if you couldn't, you drop, meaning that you go between your legs and you stay between your legs until you know it's over. You don't hop back into that one. That is a fat lip and five other people's fat lips. So if we're marching in line at a parade or something like that, and you're not in formation, your line's getting crooked, somebody yells out cover down. In our band camp world, that meant to align yourself with the group, to take notice of your stance, where you are in relation to other people, and get in alignment. So this is like that first stage of life where you are getting formal arrangements for your information. You're being taught how to do things the right way. This is just your entire childhood being brought up. You're shown different things, you practice different things, but you're shown the right way. And until you know different, that is what's right to you. But it's the do this stage. We're just learning, we're doing it. So the next stage is the action of forming or the process of being formed. This style of formation is like Plato. There's several things happening there. You have a mind-body connection where you are creating something and then you're physically the one making it happen. But if you're just sitting there squishing the Play-Doh because it's fun to play with, that's cool. But that is just the body connection. If you add in the mind and decide to participate with it, have awareness of the situation that I'm here doing this and I can do something with it. That's your mind-body connection. You also factor in spirit here. Spirit to me is like a bow and arrow. Like you spear it. You find what you want and then you shoot for that outcome. You choose it and you try it. This formation of Plato is like your trying stage because not only like I have this thing and I want to do something with it, but I'm going to have something in mind. I'm going to have an outcome of what I want it to be. This stage doesn't just like end. Neither None of these stages are just like you're done with that part of life and now you go on. It's all a continuum. So this is something that we have to revisit. And the trying stage is really difficult when you've been knocked down a few times because it just means that you have to get back up. But depending on how bad it was when you fell, you get into this mindset of like, there's a possibility of failure. So I'm not going to try it until I'm ready. 
And if you don't feel like you're a spiritual person, spirituality to me isn't like God connection. To me, it's like every decision, every behavior is a continual development of this spirit, of this choosing something beyond, of seeing outcomes, of choosing what you want, deciding what to look forward to. So you may not feel spiritual, but you are, if you are doing anything for any outcome, you are, of course, spiritual. It is your behavior with your desired outcomes. So if you don't form your desired outcome, you're just subjected to the random orientation of what life has to bring you in that stage. You're not participating. You're subjecting yourself to your life. But if you decide for yourself what you want and start to go do it, you spirit, you become the creator. They say shoot for the moon. Even if you miss, you'll land among the stars. Like if you isolate that to a physical space like a target, aim and shoot. That is true in that department. If you think of it as like you'll land among the stars and you'll be famous if you try to be famous, that's not the stuff that this is talking about. It's that emotional part where it's accessible within your field. But if you don't start participating with it, you're just going to be surrounded by targets, feeling like you have nowhere to go. Change your algorithm and click on something new. Choose a new goal. Start exploring something else. Decide what your goal is. Whatever you're feeling that isn't quite right, what's going to feel better? What does better feel like? What is a good word to settle in with what you want? Because it's not the same for everybody. If it's enlightenment and you haven't thought about what enlightenment might feel like, think about that first before you decide that thing. If it's satisfaction, decide what satisfaction feels like. Remind yourself of when you've had it. Give your body a taste of it again. If it's success, remind yourself of when you were successful. Peace and freedom, all of these things that we think we want and we say we want want, but do we know what it feels like? Do we know what to expect when we actually get there? So before you just start searching, decide what you actually want. And as you start attracting it, you'll get samples. You'll get a little taste of it along the way. Like, hey, are you sure? Yes. Say yes every time. If you're excited about it, go with it. Even if it's just like a little glimmer of it down the road, it's like, oh yeah, let yourself be excited. That's part of the trying stage too is the joy of discovery. Most of the time I get to the point where I'm really, really, really excited to do something that by the time it's over, it was like the excitement and lead up to it. I don't want to say diminish the outcome, but they factored into the entirety of the event. The more excited about it I was leading up to it, the better the total time spent was. That's free will. What are you willing to live with? That saying has been hijacked for like, to make us humble, to have no pride. What are you willing to live with? So it's like, you know, when you look at people in your life that you don't want there, it's like, why are you willing to live with that? Well, because we've been friends for this many years, or I'm the only one they've got, or whatever little reasons you tell ourselves to live with less than what you deserve. What are you willing to live with is not the same question as what are you willing to settle on. When you put your willingness at the bottom layer, you have that bar so low and that program is so strong and it feels like you're doing like same shit, different day. Everything is one after another and it's like the monotony of it driving you nuts. Or you do try to get excited about your stuff and then you say that's just not for someone like me. So you never put yourself out there to even potentially experience it. Again, that trying stage is hard when there's this potential for failure. It's not what are you willing to settle on. It's what are you willing to live with? What are you choosing to have in your life? What do you actually want in the end? How can you start with it here and grow it down the road? If you're settling, you're not participating. If you're willing, you're creating. So I've been studying human design for a while now, and it basically, it defines your individual superpowers, but we're all part of a grand system. So like, You can identify with the macro and the micro of us being a one universal mind. We're all creating what we're experiencing here. So it breaks us down into these different categories and percentages of the population, but it goes kind of in order. So there's folks that manifest, folks that generate, folks that project, and folks that reflect. So the manifestors are 10% of the population and they are the initiators. They're the idea guys. They're the ones who want to start something. So when we talk about manifestation, These days, it's more like we see the manifestation as the outcome when the thing is actually manifest real life right here. We shoot for that outcome. And that's how kind of how I've explained to you, like, see what you want and go get it. But also like you have to initiate it at the front end. The manifestation occurs when you manifest. So the manifest isn't the outcome. The manifest is the action, the starting point 
the initiate. That is you choosing it and participating with it. That's 10% of the population. There are folks who generate or alchemize. They transform matter. And I see this as, um, you know, mental matter. What matters? There's 70% of the population that are in an ongoing imprint of what they want in life. And they're sharing and spreading and expressing to exchange in our natural passing. Like if we're all one universal mind, then these 70%, these generators, they're imprinting and expressing to kind of color those folks who are more open in their design. But the generators are like the participators. They're the ones doing the thing. They're the ones touching the stove to see if it's hot. That's 70%. And about 20% are projectors or orchestrators. You can think of it as an actual projector, like it's in one area and then it's blasting into one thing. It's taking one connection, one image and amplifying it. That is what the projectors do. That is like taking the map and showing it up on the wall and using the laser pointer to show like what to do next. They're orchestrating. They're seeing what everybody else is doing and wanting to play chess. Just move the pieces, like move the seating arrangements, making the connections, amplifying the ideas. That's 20% of the population. And the reflectors are 1% of the population. And they have completely open body charts where they are, they're identified as calibrators. But what an open chart does is consume and amplify. So they are more like mirrors than calibrators. They will show you to your face what you did. This is the outcome. This is, okay, we got all the way here. This is the outcome. Now what? So it's no longer orchestrating the event or setting up for the event. It is the event is done and over with. How did we do and how can we do it better? So it's a mirror reflection, but it's also reflecting on the action. So we're all doing this within one field, within a universal mind. We're one, you and me and everybody else on the planet. We are one in a constant exchange, us and nature, everything that exists. We are a vibrational exchange. You are unlimited and your boundaries are what keep you limited. You have autonomy to decide your beliefs. And at any given time in your life, if you believed something was true, you knew it was true. And if down the road that changed, what you now believe is true is the only thing that's true. That last true thing wasn't true anymore. If you believe in truth to such an extent, in a way, you get to decide what is true. This exchange will reveal itself when you start going a little bit beyond your boundaries. Like your awareness to this participation is so key. Mm. I'm going to jump back to that, to that system, manifest, generate, project, reflect. I was going back on um, how there's a micro and macro thinking of it. I just gave you the population entirety of that's how this works. The reason I brought that up is to tell you that you can do it on an individual level because we are all in this exchange. When you want something or when you're trying to create something or when you have an idea to manifest... You can do this too. And when I look at the percentages, I see it as how this actually works when you're trying to do something on your own. So you manifest 10% of the time you're exploring what it is that you want to create. You offer like 10% of the entirety of creation is allocated to manifestation. 70% is generating it, making it happen, alchemizing it, transforming matter, changing your scenarios and situations, clicking on new buttons to change your algorithm, imprinting new emotions, imprinting new ideas, exploring the world around you. 20% is projection and orchestration. You have to sample it, a good 70% of sampling before you actually orchestrate it and try to carry it out. 20% of that energy is put into orchestrating it and carrying it out. Then 1% is allocated for reflection. In our society, we put so much energy into reflection. If something gets you down or something bad happens to you in life, it has the potential to knock someone down for years. When people have traumatic experiences, they sit in that reflection period. This has a 1% of your like energetic allocation. 1%. To keep life going, you're supposed to move on. You don't have to forget, but do in honor of your own development. Whatever it is that's got you down, let that inspire art. Like I share my art just because it holds me accountable and nobody else knows my system, but it's like, okay, I feel like I've done nothing, but here you have it. I did something today and I'm usually a little bit happy when I'm doing it, but I don't usually start doing that until like I'm not bored and wait to decide what to do. 
boredom doesn't exist. There's too much on my plate and I feel like I'm drowning. And when I get to that point, I don't want to do anything at all. And it paralyzes me to the point where I know I have so much to do. I'm not bored. It's not that I can't decide what to do next. It's that I'm not willing to do anything next because all of it sounds terrible. And I don't even know how to start doing something from this mindset. I don't even know how to get out of bed. I, I called a friend recently to be like, man, I don't even know how to get out of bed some days. It's like, give yourself a countdown. Your body knows how to respond to that. I'm like, mm, beautiful. Tried it and it works. And ever since that, even when I remind myself to do it, I still am a little pouty about it. And then I do it and then I'm moving on. But you have the autonomy to decide your beliefs, what you're capable of, what your boundaries are. And just because they're your boundaries right now, are you willing to push them a little bit? Because your fear is your consent. That is still participation. Whether or not you are participating, if you're sitting in that reflection period, but you're still acting out your day-to-day -day life, you're still doing all of these things and you're still doing all of these things for everybody around you. You're still playing your role even if you're not activated. If you're living in a place of fear, you're sharing that with your surroundings. And you know it is. If you're afraid of the government and you think that everything's going to hell in a handbasket and that's what you talk about all the time, that's your fear speaking. You're not doing anything about it. You're sharing it and spreading it. You're participating with it. If you're afraid of it, but the conversation with a friend is enlightening and feels better and that's fun, the feeling is the point that matters. Not so much the information. It's the formation of you, how you feel, how you think, what feels right and wrong. So I'm thinking of this like a deck of cards. Let's say there's a deck of playing cards and there's a deck of game cards. And in life, you have your playing cards. So the game cards get dealt. These are circumstances. These are war cards. These are death cards. These are things that you don't choose. Stuff that happens in your surroundings. This is what you're dealt. This could be where you grew up. This could be what school you went to. This could be being homeschooled. This could be being adopted. This could be any of those things that puts you in an other category or that like elicits fear. But all of those are just circumstances and there are good circumstances and bad circumstances. But these are things that happen. This isn't something you choose. This is what you're dealt. And if you can't do anything with that deck, you do have playing cards and you can stack that deck. If you're playing with a deck that you've played with your whole life, like this is my deck, this is the one I'm connected to, this is the one, this is who I am, just buy a new deck and play with it for a day. Put on a new outfit, pretend that you're someone you're not. Pretend that you do something that you don't. Just play for a day as if you have the thing you want or that you are something. Okay, like on Halloween, I was so excited to dress up with my kids I got dressed up in my costume and I was blippy. And at some point in the morning, I'm like, oh my gosh, I got to go to Meyer. I don't want to go to Meyer dressed like this. And then I was like, actually, I would love to go to Meyer dressed like this. And I hope I run into kids because that would be a riot. This is one of those situations where like you're giving someone a story to tell. And I like to say that I don't like being noticed, but like this is different. This is shifting the energy. This isn't eyes on me in a way that like what is happening What's wrong with her? This is, that's different. What is that? Some people might have those feelings, but I know what it feels like when I am goofing off and it's accepted versus when I'm goofing off and it's not. This kind of thing just like is a tap on the window and the fish just keeps swimming, but it's like, oh, what's that? That's silly. You're throwing a curveball and it doesn't hurt anybody and it doesn't help anybody, but it's different. It's that part that like changes the algorithm. My kids were fussy and they were tugging at my outfit. So I never actually got to go. I would like to tell you the outcome of that, but it never happened. That's what bitterness is. <laughs> so you stack your deck. You choose a better deck. You have access to every single deck. Whatever human being on this planet is up to, whatever exists on this planet in the mental realm, you have access to because we have one universal mind. You will only be delivered what your boundaries will allow you to receive. If you're on repetition, your boundaries are probably a little bit too limited to pull in anything new. There is a respect. There is a free will. There are barriers in place. Okay, so check these three aspects, alpha, beta, delta. Your alpha is your primary self. This is you as like a conduit. You are the information exchanger. You are the processor. You are able to receive information and you are able to express information. This is your brain tower. That's your home base. Your alpha has access to everything and only gives you what you want. So you have to listen to how you talk to yourself and what you say to yourself. If you're going to choose a better deck, 
That's like the Christmas song, deck the halls, decorations, color your story. This is your free will. You can't control everything that happens. You can't control anything that happens, but you can control how you form it on your end. Because when it does come through, is that a wide filter that it's able to come through or is it a narrow filter? That alpha resonance is your availability, what you're able to receive and what you're able to express. And it has access to the entire pool, every drop of water of consciousness, but you decide what comes in and out of that. And that's decided by your beta your boundaries, your beliefs, your dam <laughs> for your wave of information. These are your dams. When you're going to say damn, no thank you, or damn, that sucks. Or when you damn anything, you're stopping the flow. So your boundaries aren't bad. You just have to be aware of what they are and what they're capable of and what you're capable of when you're willing to adjust that barrier a little bit. And your delta is this part, what's your delta? So in dealing with what you're dealt, you have to backtrack it to your beta, to your boundaries, to your belief system, back to your alpha. What are you letting in? What are you putting out? What are you participating with? And we use all of these in our actions. You have to identify those little areas. Is this working? Why am I doing this? Does it make sense? You get to control how you form things. So that stage one, that do it stage foundational, starting, learning, exploring. Stage two is that spirit, decide what you want and then go do it. Like you get to choose your goals now. And then stage three is a structure or arrangement of something. So that first one was the formal arrangement. The second area was the action of forming or the process of being formed. This one is all about the structure or arrangement, the formation. This is when you're playing the game. You're no longer finding the right cards to decorate with, to participate with. The stuff that makes you happy is great, but let's say that that's already shuffled into your decks. And we're in the play mode where you have to, when you factor in that new deck, you still have your whole entire old deck to deal with. So it is like a sampling session where it's like you get a good, a new card, great move forward. You get an old card. You get to choose now if you want to continue on the same way or if you want to do something different. You can pass on the old card and wait for a new card. You can change the old card into a new card. You can exchange them with your friends for different trading cards. You can do whatever you want. But when you're just introducing something new to something old, you're just shuffling the deck and you still have that old stuff to deal with really get into your metaphors and sort them out like this. When you play the game, you have to you have to participate with it. You have to decide. Break up your system a little bit and do something weird. Be okay in yourself that your surroundings don't matter. You can show up as who you are. Once you have your those boundaries identified where you want to stay of what feels good and what feels right, like you don't have to worry about, am I in the right place with the right people? You're always in the right place if you're right with yourself. And then you always get to choose what to do next. You don't have to worry a scale of anybody being out to get you. You won't be putting yourself in positions for people to get something from you that you didn't consent to. If that's what you decide, decide these things for yourself, but shake it up a little bit. Let it be okay to do something weird. Like I take the steps at home two at a time sometimes when I'm alone. And it's just a little bit weird, but it makes my brain think different for a couple seconds. If I haven't done my push-ups for the day after I do those weird steps, I'm like, yeah, let's just get them over with. I'm already basically right there. Doing something weird tricks your brain into making different feel easy, especially when you make different easy. Last summer, my partner and I went to a concert, a little show in Columbus, two bands from 20 years ago, and I knew some of the songs, but I wasn't really familiar with either. But still, it sounded like I love live music, love that environment. I was excited to go. So we went and saw them, had a blast. One of those bands was coming back to town, and I had an opportunity to go. So when we were there at the first show, I had so much fun dancing, and this guy puts on a hell of a show that, like, doesn't matter if you know the music or not, you're going to have a good time. So when he came came back around, I was thinking like, oh my gosh, I remember how I felt in that room. I remember what he brings to the table. I want to go to that. And I didn't really orchestrate it. And then I had a plan for the evening that kind of fell through and the opportunity was like available again, but I'd be available to go by myself unless I made some frantic last minute phone calls. So I used to go to shows by myself all the time. I don't mind that. It was just like, am I going to make the hour drive to go do this thing? So yes, I did. And I was excited and I was looking forward to it. And I was jamming on the way down and I I didn't like having to look for a parking spot by myself in Columbus, but I made it. <laughs> and once we get inside the venue, well, first of all, I thought the show started at 630. I just wasn't even paying attention. It was last minute. I was like, oh, should go now. 
I showed up and doors weren't even open yet. And I am very comfortable with being late to things. I like people settled in and then me showing up. When the vibe is already settled, I like to sneak in when that happens. So the fact that I was part of like creating the vibe, didn't love that idea, but got into it. Ansi getting ready for the show to start and somebody comes up and says, are you here by yourself? And I was like, yes, I am. <laughs> and she's like, how? I have wanted to see them for so many years and I couldn't get anyone to go with me. And there was no way I was going by myself. My boyfriend came with me and, and he doesn't want to be here. <laughs> And I'm cracking up because I get it because I get it. But if I was going to come, it was really my only option unless I tried really, really hard. And I wasn't willing to try because I was very comfortable with going by myself. But now that we had established this, you know, we get into concert talk. Last time I saw them, da, 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 da. oh, you saw them? Yeah, they were with them. Oh, I saw them with them and blah, 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 blah. So you get into like the concert talk conversations and you start like you're just never alone even when you go alone. And I didn't even have to make eye contact with anybody or do anything. I just had to show up, but I wasn't even alone before the music even started. So then everything's established. I like to get right in the heart of it. The opener comes on and he's having a good time. It's his second day of the tour. He's 17 years old, so nervous and so excited. And it is adorable. I love every second of it. And then I see there's a kid up at the front, like a small child whose dad is behind them. And the whole crowd that is like nearby sees what's happening and they protect the crap out of that kid for the rest of the night. So main event, the Rocket Summer comes on and he does what he does. We're having a blast. And then some chick comes up from the back and starts like really pounding her way through China dance. And there's like just this unity that forms to like protect that kid in the bubble. And she's really going for it. And one of the girls just steps up, gently tells her in her ear, like, there is a child. Gently tells her, we're at a concert. She's screaming, but she's not being a dick. But she's like, there's a child up here. You can't bring that energy out this way. Like you can settle over that way, but like this is protected. And the chick goes back. There was no pushback. It was like, oh, I see what's happening. And now that I know, I'm not going to do that. There was such a big unity in that moment of like, don't mess this up for anybody. So many of those people, it was their first time at one of his shows. And like I said, his first album was 20 years ago. So people have been waiting for this moment. Like the build up to this event was a whole collective vibe. Listening to everybody sing along and really stopping and turning around to watch everybody do it. Ooh, I was excited to go let in with good vibes, but I exited with so much of that energy. And I'm glad that I was weird and shook it up and deposited my otherness with other people elsewhere. <laughs> we're doing this collective exchange, but then we're so tied in on what's actually happening. Like this unity feels so selfless. Like it's not about me. You can tell it's about all of us. And I'm not even like, I'm not even a fan like that. I just love how it feels to be around that. After I get home and settle, the next day, I'm not really there yet. I'm not really present. I'm feeling spacey. And I chalked it up to like just distortion. Like there was a lot of noise, a lot of happening. Maybe I just haven't caught up with myself yet. It was an information overload to my senses. Loud, physically different areas, the driving, visually, like I took in a lot. Maybe I'm just not caught up yet. And it was kind of both. Part of me was still there with the group that I was with, replaying, refeeling, just attached to that previous evening. I was caught up in that energy swirl and that energetic presence is fueled by me and everybody else that was there. Like if we're still adding to that fire, because yeah, adding to the fire, if I could describe that concert in one emoji, it would be fire. <laughs> When you get that energy together, it dissipates when it's over, but that smoke is still there. Like it's foggy. It's still there and it's still being like, tss, and it lingers. And then I talked on the phone with my mom in this real world conversation. Like I told her how I was feeling, but also like I was heading into school. And now that I'm in this flexi stage where like, I'm cool where I'm at. I got to work on my alignment. My surroundings don't dictate my behavior and emotion. They still kind of do. I'm like, I said, I'm working on it. <laughs> But like going to work used to be like, hang your problems up at the door. It was like walking in the work at door was like a portal, a compartmentalization where I could turn it on and could turn it off. I walk in that door and I'm a manager now. I'm not a mom anymore. I'm a manager here. That's why I don't do that stuff anymore is because that compartmentalization isn't actually helpful. So I'm allowing myself to feel these feelings. I'm allowing it rather than, I'm allowing it to flow through and with me, but I have to regain my clarity from my real world, my here world. 
take ownership of myself, correct my course, still ride the waves and have a good time and feel great about everything that happened, but right my ship and realize where I'm at. It doesn't have to be a portal, like turn it off. You don't get to enjoy this anymore. It's time to focus on school, but let that goodness sprinkle into the rest of it. You can balance and do both. That's your structure and arrangement. Focus on getting yourself in formation. Judgment is a big barrier to that. So pay attention to the words you use and how you use them. Like identify how you're actually talking to yourself and whether or not that's serving you. Every time you tell yourself that you can't do something, you're right. And every time you tell yourself that you can, you're right. It doesn't mean you're going to do it on the first try. Pay attention to what you're actually telling yourself. When I talk about the self, I think about the cells. Because what you say has a quantum effect. It doesn't just affect the now moment. It embeds itself into our reality. When you identify something with a self statement, it sprinkles those feelings through every cell of your body. You're decorating your halls. You're coloring your cells. You're coloring yourself. Every time that you self comment, you are making changes in your body. When I mention stacking the decks, I say whatever anybody else is capable of, you are too. You can stack your deck and take new pieces. You can take on new things. You can share ideas. Whatever anybody else has access to, so do you. And that's where judgment comes into play. If you can see somebody, anybody on this planet that you can't identify with, at least as a human being, you don't have access to certain information. If you look at Hitler and just think that he was a monster and not an actual person, you don't get access to certain information. If you can't align yourself, you cannot be in formation with certain ideas. And you might think, why would I want to align myself to Hitler? <laughs> you have to sit in some difficult mental space to really get through some different ideas. I spent a lot of time in that mental space with Hitler where it's... If you take the judgment out of it and look at the human for the human behavior and not this man as a monster trying to destroy people and everything... But from a person perspective, if I was looking through those eyes, what's going on in my head? Also, I used to love the show Criminal Minds. If that's not obvious, get into the mind of the killer. What's going on up there? This dude, assuming there's no CIA intervention or any crazy shit like that, this dude just grew up and nobody loved him when he was doing what he loved. He found something he was good at. He got too good at it, feared that he was going to lose it, doubled down on that fear, and everybody went along with it. Everybody encouraged it. Nothing felt good. Nothing felt right. Everything came from a place of fear. And there was still very much active participation from that fear space. But if the only thing anybody actually loves you for is being threatened, you'll do just about anything to save it. And I can see that as a person-to-person -person exchange. Overcoming that barrier, being able to look through those eyes from the inside, being able to think, what do I know about you? What do I think about you? None of that is actually human. What's going on with the human? So when something nasty and ugly comes up, you can see how someone gets there. So it's important to kind of dig through and hit these boundaries. Explore your barriers from the safety of your mind. If you can't even try to identify that experience, if you can't try to get behind the mind of somebody that you're not, that you don't see the value in, that's, that's it. Yeah, there's value in every human. There's value in every human. To release your judgment, you have access to so much more information. Especially if you're expressing goodness, you're going to receive goodness. And you can receive it with abundance if you explore some of those barriers. Being able to get into that mind, it was the same kind of thing where when I'm studying quantum physics and I read different quotes from Einstein, not even about quantum physics, but just like, this is how he thinks about life. You know, like one of the things that he'd said was you spend more time figuring out what the problem is before what the solution is. If you look at that in our structure where the, there's like the 10% initiators, then 70% of that time is generators alchemizing. Like that is the part where you're like imprinting, offering new ideas, brainstorming. You're trying to figure out what the point is. Then once you figure out what the point is and you've spent all that time there, then you get to orchestration, then you get to solution, and then you reflect and move on. You either keep it going, turn it off, you know, try anything from there on out. That the important part of the structure was really identifying what the real problem is, not what a solution is, but what is the actual problem. And just exploring some of those ideas and thinking about what he has to say about it, like I get new ideas from it. While I'm learning about quantum physics, I get new ideas while I'm thinking about it. While I'm playing in other areas, being entertained by media and dumb shit, I get new ideas based on the stuff that was formed, new quantum realm ideas by watching The Simpsons. 
Everything is interconnected. And information is just knowledge that has been formed and shared. It's packaged for you. But there's other stuff that's not packaged for you that come to you in the form of an idea or a feeling, whatever it is. If there's something that you want to express or learn more about or explore in depth or have always wondered what that's like, spend some time and explore what it actually might feel like. Identify that relationship with your body. Show your body, give your body a sample of it. Give yourself a taste of what it feels like to get what you want. Identify the thing that you actually want and spend some time there and focus on the feelings that come out of it and not the like, I felt this emotion and I felt that emotion. But what does your body actually feel? What do you actually feel when you get that thing? You know, even driving up, I was thinking about how I'm going out tonight. And I remember how often I used to go out and I used to be excited to, I really, I was excited to get hammered. I was so excited to clock out and drink so much alcohol and then go to bed and come back to work tomorrow. I was very excited to do that at one point in life. And if you really look at how that spreads out, if you look at it like a chart of happiness of when is she the most herself? When is she glowing? When is she happy? When is she thriving? When is she aliving? When does she show up? She shows up for herself when she's clocking out and she's excited to go drink. It's not when she's drinking. It's not when she's drunk. It's not when she's working. It's not when she's sleeping. It's when she's clocking out and deciding her next thing to do, and she's excited to go do that thing. Now, there are other things happening, the chemical exchange of drinking alcohol, whatever, the emotional baggage of the work that I was doing. Yeah, that's how I was choosing to balance that at the time. But that's not the important part. And it's that's why it's like the things and the emotions and the words are not important, but the feeling is what matters. When were you the brightest? When are you the best? Where are you allowing that for yourself now? Where do you take it away from yourself? Where do you start with that feeling and end up feeling like absolute garbage that night? Where are you missing the mark? It's in your behavior. Pay attention to what you're doing. Pay attention to how you feel while you're doing it and deposit better ideas. Formulate a new formation and dive into it. Thanks for listening to another episode of Unravel with Allison. If you have any feedback, questions, want to chit chat or stay up to date on new releases, follow me on Instagram at Allison K. Steele. Let's keep in touch. Again, thanks for listening and I'll catch you next episode.